What has been your biggest, I have to get the f out of here as soon as possible, life moment? Story 1. I found a setup that my stepdad made in my room to record me after I was finished with the shower and was getting changed. Yes, I'm going to be that person. While many people may not see it, I think it's important I say this. There is an overwhelming amount of people who do not know how things like this happen, and a lot of people don't seem to know how to help either. Silence is what keeps kids from getting help. If you see something off, say something. You're an adult and are capable of helping. A child is not able to protect themselves and there's only so much they can do. Be the person kids trust. Who knows? Maybe if I had someone I could trust and tell this to, then I wouldn't have to wait until I was older to remember on my own. Thank you for the overflow of support and people combating the trolls. Story 2. I was walking home from the gym in Seattle, and I would always walk by this weird house with blankets over the windows. There was also a fenced inside yard packed with old busted RVs and garbage. This particular night, there was an old dude with a long white beard standing in front of the house in a bathrobe, smoking a cigarette. I had never seen anyone in front of the house before, and what I heard sounded like a Prius pulling up to a stoplight, but was, in fact, several Seattle police cars rolling up with their engines and lights off. I don't even know how they got that quiet. Then I saw a few officers approaching the house and the old man with their guns drawn, completely silently. One of them made eye contact with me and made a fairly violent hand motion for me to go in a different direction. So I did, very quickly. About a month later, that house was torn down. I have no idea what happened that night, and I'm glad I didn't have to find out. Story 3 I had been sleep deprived for a few weeks during a very stressful summer. To pass the time, I'd go for long walks late at night, sometimes stopping at a gas station or supermarket to buy a snack. One night, at about 3 a.m., I had a sudden urge to walk to a 24-hour diner at the edge of my neighborhood. I was hungry and needed the exercise. I walk in, and the place is largely empty. The waitress comes, takes my order, pours my coffee, then disappears into the kitchen. About two minutes later, the door opens and a man in a trench coat walks in, pacing nervously by the register. I see him pull out a gun and immediately my mind starts racing. I quickly conclude that there are a few possibilities. He's going to rob the diner and leave us unharmed. Or, he's going to rob the diner and sh everyone inside. Or he's just going to sh everyone inside, just because. The waitress emerges from the kitchen, unable to see the gun from behind the counter. I'm the only customer who knows what's coming, and the weight of the world is on my shoulders. Table for one? She asks. The man shakes his head. I'm here to see Jeremy. Okay, I figure. He's here to kill Jeremy. Although I wasn't a target, it was horrifying to be sitting so close to what was about to become a murder scene. I braced myself as best as I could for the sound of the gunshot as I sunk deep into my seat. Complete terror. There was nowhere for me to go. Should I remain silent when he killed this guy? Should I yell out a warning to Jeremy and risk getting myself killed? I clutched a very sharp steak knife on the table and went with my gut instinct. I was probably going to die, but I had to do this. I had to rush the shooter and stab him before he took the life of the cook. As I prepare to kill someone, Jeremy emerges from the kitchen with a wide grin on his face. You must be Frank. Out comes a wad of cash and up comes the gun, which is placed right in the counter. Looks even nicer than the pictures. Turns out they had met to sell and purchase a gun from a Craigslist ad. Most terrifying moment of my life. Judging from the many people I've talked to since, gun owners included, this was a very unusual event in every respect. I'm sure that the transaction was illegal due to the weird and highly unprofessional way in which it occurred. If the gun had been in a holster or container, I wouldn't have panicked. Although his finger wasn't on the trigger, I felt uneasy seeing the firearm in his hand when it didn't need to be. Story 4 My ex and I have been divorced for 7 years. When she came clean and admitted she's been seeing another guy for almost a year. I'd been sleeping with a said guy in our bed while I was at work for a year. I noped out of there as fast as I could. It was no longer my house as far as I was concerned. My son is now 10 years old, he was 3 at the time. When birthdays or other celebratory events come around, there's always one on mom's side and one on my side. He has cousins and friends and relatives on each side, but I still always get an invite to a birthday party or whatnot from the ex. Why? I don't know. And every single time I accepted it, I sucked it up and showed up and sat around and made small talk with Mr. Davis, the new boyfriend, and all of their friends, because I'll be damned if I'd be the parent that triggered the how come dad didn't come to my birthday party conversation. But every single one of these events was agonizing. Nails on the blackboard, water torture, agonizing. I mean, all I want to do is punch the guy. Yet here I am talking about the weather and going to the local sports team. Usually, I figured if I made it past the cake to the presents and my son was running around nerf guns at the other kids, that was good enough. Time to make my escape. My son, thankfully, and at the same time, sadly, put me out of my misery. Last summer, coming over the weekend before his birthday, he said to me, Dad, here's mom's invite to my birthday party. It is going to be small, just... List of mom and mom's boyfriend's friends and their kids. 
but I get it if you have other plans. I'll see you next weekend at a place in my friend's house where we too will be having a birthday party with a list of his friends. That's the one I'm looking forward to. Story 5. Chechnya and I think 1995. There were obviously a lot of those moments, but one that stood out was when I was walking back to the apartment block I was staying at, and I realized the entire block was not only empty, but all of the cars were moved out of the way, and there was a carpet laid out about 20 feet in front of me. I had no idea what was under the carpet or why it was there, but it just felt so suspicious, and of course, my first instinct is to run away. The second I turn around, someone from afar opens fire at me, presumably a sniper but could have been closer, and then heard shouting and screaming for men to run and get me. The shouts were far away. They knew they weren't going to be able to capture me. That f***ing carpet, man. I won't ever forget that carpet. My biggest guess was they built a hole under the carpet for people like me to fall into. Then they would capture and rape or torture you for whatever they would want. Lots of f***ed up marauders and bandits in Grozny during the war. Story 6 When I was 12, my next door neighbor invited me to summer camp. My parents dropped me off, realized immediately that the camp was odd because the cabin counselor took away my copy of Jane magazine. Then there was a camp-wide assembly where we prayed over a photo of George Bush and spoke in tongues. Turned out it was a Pentecostal sleepaway camp. I walked to town and called my parents from a gas station. For anyone who's wondering, Pentecostalism is basically, it's a very rigid Christian movement that emphasizes all sorts of weirdness, including speaking in tongues, faith healing, water baptism, personal testament, and these very emotional services where people cry and weep and scream. This was not the camp in Jesus camp, but it was remarkably similar. It was not Cole County, Pennsylvania. I'm not really familiar with much about Pentecostals, honestly, but a major component seemed to be this baptismal pool, a dunking tank. They had one in which everyone was expected to be publicly baptized in service, with a whole church attending. I remember the church leader also led a yearly retreat to Israel for public baptism in some famous river there. She would always kind of gesture knowingly to me when she said, and Then we went to Israel. And I'm about as Jewish as a Dunkin' Donuts bagel. In general, there was a lot of emphasis on saving, being saved, and the Holy Spirit entering you, which I had never heard of before this. The praying was done with a photo of George W. Bush sat in a chair. This was right around the time of some anti-abortion legislation in the early 2000s, and we were praying for his strength. Story 7 Every once in a while, your gut tells you something is up. I'm at a party and get that tingling in my gut telling me I'm not okay here. I finally just decide to leave with a few friends to chill at my place. A few hours later, I got a phone call from another friend asking if I was okay. Apparently, the house belonged to a guy who was affiliated with gangs. Some thugs tried to crash the party and when they got kicked out, they started fighting people. A big fight breaks out and a few people ended up in the hospital. Eventually, the house owner brought out a gun and shot a few rounds in the air, and that's when everyone scattered away from the area. The cops were called and people were arrested. Meanwhile, I left hours ago and was currently playing drunk video games with a couple of friends. Sometimes, your gut's right. Story 8 For a few months, I worked as a bartender in a very small pub in London. I'm from the United States. One night, it was overtaken by Irish travelers and it was f***ing terrifying. Absolute madness. I did not know it was humanly possible to guzzle Guinness at such an alarming rate. And now I know. Yes, there were gypsies. I attempted to be somewhat kind to the world traveler. I did not know about them beforehand other than the good old TLC network, despite my unbelievably Irish heritage, so it was certainly a shock. I'm a young 20-something female as well, so let's just say I wasn't treated with the utmost respect that evening. Some paid, others didn't. Almost every single guy got beyond blackout level obliterated, and eventually... They were just coming in and out with random handles of vodka and chugging straight from them. The girlfriends and wives, straight out of my boyfriend gypsy wedding, all sat together in one section and were only allowed half pints at a time. It was bizarre. Towards the end of the night, I simply sat in a keg behind the bar in a corner, trying to process what the actual f*** was going on before my eyes, and tried to avoid contact if possible. I didn't leave the establishment for obvious reasons, but a few of the local guys who drank at the pub regularly stayed with us to watch everything over. We stayed open well beyond closed just to try and let it all die down without getting the cops involved. Every time I try to tell this story to my friends here in the United States, it's a total letdown because no one can actually comprehend who or what I'm talking about. Story 9 This was back in Russia when I was 14. I decided that it was a good idea to walk home from a party at 2 a.m. in a rural area. We had a summer home in Dacha outside of Moscow, literally middle of nowhere. As I was walking, a car pulled up and a guy, who looked to be in his 30s, Asked me if I needed a ride. Being a moron, I said, sure, and got into his car. As he pulled up to the gates of our Dodge community, he stopped and asked me if I wanted to come with him to a party. He was a construction worker in the area, with his friends. 
My heart skipped a beat, and as I looked at the car door to look for an escape plan, I saw that the door handle was missing from the inside, so I had no way of opening the door. At this point, I felt my heart beating in my stomach, and I said, No, sorry, my mom is waiting for me. All of a sudden, he said, Well, mother is a sacred thing. You better go. He got out, walked around the car, and let me out. It was the last time that I hiked alone. Story 10 I worked for a small family-owned business, and it was a mother and son-operated store. They owned it together and ran it for 30 years. A month ago, the mother passed away. My boss, the son, didn't close the store and has cried in the lobby with other customers every single day since she passed away. He still tells everyone about it and is rude to the people that didn't play into his pity party. We even had new customers and he scared them off by telling them within 5 minutes of being in the store. Anyways, over the last two weeks, he's also been micromanaging like crazy and is starting to progressively yell when talking to me or other employees. However, last week, he started wearing his mom's shop apron, started saying her euphemisms, and started eating her exact lunch. It's eerie because he's even starting to look like her. Yesterday, I walked into the office and there was an urn in her desk chair. He said he placed her urn in her office so that way it's not like she ever left. The urn, full of her ashes, in her desk chair, he then said, Now we can say hi to her. I walked out yesterday after that happened and didn't look back. Story 11 When I was 19, my dad's girlfriend, who just got out of jail for murder, moved into our house. He didn't tell me she was out of jail and moving in. I moved out that day and couch top for a few months, because f that. They've known each other since they were children. I don't claim at all to understand what was going on through his head. But as far as I understand it, she hasn't believing she's actually innocent. They were dating before this happened. She went to jail because she was a nurse at an elderly home. One day, she decided it'd be a good idea to inject some old lady with insulin, kill her, and steal her credit cards. She's caught on tape at an ATM with him. That is literally all I know about the situation. No clue how she managed to get out early. I only learned these details from the local newspaper. It's very hard for a 19-year-old to deal with. Story 12 When I was 15 or 16, I got my hands on an edible brownie. My dealer told me it was really strong and to eat half of it. I thought I would have it before Thanksgiving dinner. I ate it, but didn't feel anything after about 10 minutes, so I ate the rest. I didn't know that edibles didn't hit you right away, and by the time that it did hit me, it hit me really hard. I was so hot during dinner. I was making things very uncomfortable for my parents and my godparents. I refused to look up from my plate and was dodging questions. After about 15 minutes or so, I had to get out of there. So I just picked up my plate and went downstairs to my room. My mom came after me and asked me what the hell was wrong with me, and I explained I was really hot and needed to be alone. Story 13. I was driven to work one night, and this lady had a broken down car, so we decided to try and be helpful. She lived close by and didn't have any family to come pick her up. She told us she needed to stop by the bank if we didn't mind, and we didn't. We took her to the bank so she could get $20 out to buy groceries the next day. She seemed down on her luck, and we knew what that was like, so we got $20 out for her. No big deal. She said she has another stop and had to tell her friend that her rent would be late. At this point, it is becoming a hassle and we are closing in on being late for work. I can't risk my livelihood for a stranger. After we got to the neighborhood, I became very worried. I told her we only had time to drop her off at her house or her friends, but it was up to her as they were both close. She started screaming at us and yelling that we would do anything she demanded. We stopped the car, I looked her dead in the eyes and said, You take your things and you get out of my car right now. She tried to leave without taking her stuff so we would be forced to wait for her. I said, Stop! If you don't take your things, I will literally drive away with them. So she grabbed her stuff and got out and we drove away. Story 14 It's the 4th of July, was setting off fireworks with family and friends on a dead-end road that leads into a cul-de-sac. A car park at the stop sign facing us in the cul-de-sac and sits there a few minutes. We thought the driver was looking at a map. Suddenly, he just guns it towards us, swerved at a few people, and nearly struck a couple of my neighbors. As it kept going down the road into the dead end, the car almost went straight through my neighbor's garage door at the center end of the cul-de-sac. It swung around in a drift-like curve and sped past my neighbors and family again, but by then, I had noped the f*** out and was frantically running into my neighbor's yard two doors down perpendicular from the cul-de-sac. I found out later that the guy was drunk, obviously, and had used his dad's car for the deed. No charges were made, but the dad had no clue his kid had used his car when the officer showed up. Story 15 my dad, sister, she was little at the time, and I were on vacation at the Grand Canyon. But we were still enjoying the view when she started laughing at something, so I turned around. She was marveling that her hair was standing on end, like when you rub a balloon and hold it over your head. I immediately recognized the situation and yelled, Get back to the car! 30 seconds later, lightning struck a few hundred feet from where we were standing. Story 16 
In 2004, my parents filed for a divorce. My mom worked a traditional 9-to-5 job, and my dad worked as a contractor. It was my dad's responsibility to get us to school in the mornings, so my mom would drop my sister and me off before work. One morning, we were running late because we had managed to hit every red light en route to dad's house. Typically, when we were late, my dad would hold out a sign that detailed our tardiness, but today he was not outside. Instead, he walked to the car from the house as we pulled up, walked over to the window, and handed my mom an envelope. Though the behavior seems normal, something felt wrong. As I turned to say goodbye to my mom, I heard a sh**. My dad had sh** my mom and continued to do so two more times into her thigh. Time seemed to stop, and I got my sister back in the car with her head down at the same time and screamed for help. I remember a gun to my mom's head that didn't fire when the trigger was pulled, and my dad responded by running back to the house and pulling the gun to his head. At this point, my mom had assured me she could drive. My sister was crouched in the back footwell, and I was trying to dial 911. I felt the need to get the f*** out as we pulled up, but I had to stay put through the entire situation. Story 17. I'm a wedding photographer. One wedding was taking place at a historical village. It consisted of 100 plus year old houses which were once disassembled, moved to their current location, then painstakingly reassembled inch by inch to maintain this piece of history. The groom's mother was the president of the venue's organization. She, of course, was very proud to host her son's wedding at the same place she volunteered at. The wedding was great laid back and non-traditional. I stayed even a little longer than scheduled since things were so easy. Things finally started winding down around 11 or so, and everyone was drunk, but they had one thing left in store. Lanterns. The kind that you light and then fly away into the night. Nothing is quite as romantic as lanterns. However, alcohol plus floating fire plus tall trees plus historical villages are not a recipe for success. While everyone tried to light their lanterns, the groom's mother caught wind of what was happening. She ran out into the village, screaming for everyone to stop. Drunk and distracted by the challenge, no one listened. Everyone kept trying to get their lanterns to take off. And one finally did, right into the lush tree that sprawled out approximately 20 feet above the village. This is when I thought it would be a good idea to leave. The lantern was stuck between some branches, burning ferociously. Groom's mother literally cried watching what she thought would be her beloved historical village going up in flames. Walking out, I saw the lantern narrowly drift through an opening in the branches and fly off into the distance. 